Thank you. <laughs> All right, my name is Lynn Reamer. I'm known as a mad chemist because I have a degree in chemistry, biology, and psychology, and I've done everything from autopsies to Xeroxing. I was a forensic chemist with the Drug Enforcement Administration in San Francisco, where we analyzed drugs from all over the world and we took down meth labs. I spent seven years as a chemist criminalist with the North Metro Drug Task Force. That is the task force that handles this area. We handled all of Adams and Broomfield County, and as you all know, all we did was drug investigation. So I've been on thousands and thousands of drug deals and drug busts. I've personally been involved with the processing of well over 250 meth labs. I am a recognized expert all over the state when it comes to manufacturing meth, health effects, chemical contamination, child abuse, parental issues, all that fun kind of stuff. I left the task force, I think it's coming up on like six years now, and I'm just out doing nationwide training. I have a nonprofit where I receive funding um, from foundations to specifically go in schools and talk to kids, talk to school staff, talk to parents, and that's what I spend a majority of my time doing now. But I do do national and international conferences as well. Um, for eight years here in Colorado, I trained the Colorado Department of Human Services for everyone that went into homes as part of their daily job duties. I trained all the realtors in Colorado regarding cleanup, disclosure, meth lab liability, all that fun stuff when you all want to buy or sell a house now. Um, I do training with the oil industry, and I am affectionately known around the state as the Martha Stewart of meth labs. So if any of you guys want to go to the dark side and break bad, I can break bad, bad and break bad breaks bad. Breaking bad is not even making meth right, thank God. Um, but yeah, I can go to the dark side if you want to go there. So um, this is going to be very informal. If you guys have any questions at any time, don't hesitate to ask. If you want to add anything uh, at any time, feel free to do that as well. Uh, but we'll just get started, and we are just talking uh, everything marijuana today. So um, as you all know, um, marijuana is becoming a problem uh, in Colorado. So. It is best that uh, everybody get educated about it, and it all starts with the marijuana plant. Now, there are three different strands of the cannabis sativa plant, uh, and all those, uh, the plants, a uh, uh, number of people know about. One is called hemp. You guys know hemp? Uh, hemp um, isn't grown for its uh, psychoactive compounds because it doesn't have any. It's grown for its strong fiber. You know, they make a lot of clothing out of hemp. They make... Um, industrial stuff, they make paper, they make hammocks, uh, they make tents, and all kinds of stuff. And it also has some beneficial properties as far as protein and omegas. So, you know, they have hemp protein powder now. They have hemp uh, seeds that are really good. They have hemp milk. You can buy hemp lotion, like, uh, and then they have oils that you can bake with, like uh, olive oil and hemp oil. Um, I haven't tried that one yet. They have hemp toothpaste. They have hemp uh, deodorant. They have hemp everything, and hemp doesn't have any active cannabinoids in it. Uh, the other two um, do, and one is called indica, and indica has a high amount of CBD in it. That stands for cannabidiol and a little bit of THC. That's tetrahydrocannabinol, the psychoactive ingredient that makes people feel high. And indica, indica is most used by people who use marijuana medicinally, and the most prominent strand of marijuana that everybody knows here in Colorado is called Charlotte's Web. Have you heard of Charlotte's Web? Charlotte's Web is the form of marijuana, the strand of marijuana that the brothers down at the Realm of Caring in Colorado Springs, who have a big uh, medical marijuana dispensary, they grow it, extract out CBD, and then sell it to parents whose kids have intractable seizures. Have you heard that? And so that's where that strand comes from. It's used medicinally. Now, the first girl that they gave it to that it helped they named the plant after her. Her name was Charlotte. And so they did name it after her. Um, the interesting thing about this CBD marijuana in Charlotte's Web is they have been looking at indica strands with seizures across the U.S. in children's hospitals for the last three and a half years. And they are finding exactly what we're seeing here in Colorado. And that is less than one third get positive benefit from this if they're having seizures. That means two thirds get worse or have no change. And so some kids it does help and it's used medicinally. I know a lot of people use it medicinally here in Colorado for MS with their muscle spasticity. You know, it locks their muscles. Cerebral palsy is another one. It relaxes the muscles. It's more sedating and it's known as the body plant because it helps a little with pain 
helps with relaxing muscles and some other things. People use it with um, chemotherapy and cancer because cancer just tears uh, everything up. The chemotherapy kills every living cell and every bad cell in the body, and that's very painful. Uh, THC helps them keep the food down. Uh, it does something to the vomiting mechanism, and so they keep food down, stays in their stomach, body gets nourished from nutrients, uh, and they seem to get better. So the indica plant does have a lot of medicinal promise to it, and it is used uh, by a number of people here in Colorado uh, and worldwide. The other type of plant, though, that most of society wants is called the sativa plant. And that plant has a high amount of THC in it, tetrahydrocannabinol, and a little bit of CBD in it. Now, when you look at the marijuana plant as a whole, there are like 70 different cannabinoids in the plant. Only right now they've identified, I think it's right around eight, that have any sort of psychoactive or active properties that show benefit or harm. So we have a lot more to go as far as understanding this plant has over 600 chemicals in it, and many of them have not been identified yet. Um, so it all starts with that marijuana plant and exactly how they're growing it. And so what uh, people don't understand today is the marijuana today is unlike the marijuana we have ever seen before. It uh, is nothing like the marijuana that was out there when I was a kid, nothing like the marijuana that was out there when most people were kids uh, here in the room, and certainly nothing similar to as little as 10 years ago. Today, marijuana has become genetically modified, meaning they take the different strands of marijuana and they clone them and create hybrids. So they'll take one strand of indica, and this is what the brothers at the Realm of Caring did. They took a strand of indica, another strand of indica, cloned them, and created a new hybrid. Now, this new hybrid has more CBD in the buds than the one they started with. So they take that plant, get another uh, indica plant, clone it, new plant. So they're constantly growing and changing uh, the, the plant to produce higher amounts of either CBD or THC in it. And so it all starts there. And so the THC is in the buds. Uh, it's not in the leaves, it's not in the stem, it's in the bud. And if you've heard of the word perps around marijuana, perps, it's purple. And so the bud is very, very pretty. Has anyone here ever heard of white widow or white rhino? Uh, that has white fibers on the bud, and it just glows this pretty white. So sometimes name uh, does go back to the different strands as well. Well, the THC is in the bud. It's in the trichome of the bud, and this is a bud that is magnified about a million times. Those little glossy hook-looking things there are the trichome, and then these little bubbles on it is your THC and your cannabinoids and stuff. So it all starts with the bud and the way they're growing it, and it is very, very potent today. And when you look at the marijuana uh, buds that are in Colorado now in the plant, the THC in these buds can range anywhere from 18 to 35 percent, but it's constantly rising. When I was a kid, THC in marijuana was 2 to 3 percent. In the 80s, it got up to about 5 to 7. In 2003, it started hovering right around 14 percent. Now it is skyrocketing. Have you guys heard of the marijuana concentrates? where they extract the THC out of the bud. There's no plant material. It's that concentrated THC and CBD then for the indica side. The THC in these concentrates today from the sativa can be anywhere from 50 to 90% THC. So should we really be consuming anything, especially a drug that's 80 or 90% pure? No, and that's a lot of the problem today. This stuff is so potent, we don't have any science on it. We have no idea what to expect because it's nothing like when we were kids. You know, you have to look back on to see how it affected society. And we just don't have any data on as potent as it is today. And so we're kind of rolling with it um, as we go along. And so people need to understand that this is just a very, very potent drug. And they do put the concentrates, the oils and stuff, in the edibles. And are we hearing a lot about the edibles and the problems with edibles today? Yeah, and it's just because it is so potent. And so people need to kind of understand that this is a very, very potent drug. And, you know, it's different than we have ever seen before. And so it does all start with that plant material. And here's the law, if you don't know what the law says. The law says that you have to be 21 or older um, for it to be treated legally. And everyone thinks Colorado got rid of their criminal law. We did not. Our criminal law is the same today uh, as it was last year, years ago, and will be a year from tomorrow. All Colorado did was pass Am Amendment 64, and that creates limited exceptions to our criminal law. So if you stay within the exceptions right here, it's treated as legal, but go outside of the parameters, 
and it is still charged as an illegal drug in this state. And so, um, you know, not a lot of people know that. Now, if you're 21 or older, you can possess, transport, purchase up to one ounce at any time. If law enforcement gets, bu uh, gets involved with you and you have five ounces on you, you're going to get arrested uh, accordingly because you're outside of the parameters of the law and it is treated as illegal. Colorado says you can grow six plants, two of which can be mature at a time. Uh, and this is kind of crazy part of the law and I wouldn't be surprised if it does get blown up uh, because one, how do you regulate everybody growing their own marijuana? Can you do it? No. And so Colorado's become the distribution hub for black market illegal marijuana in the U.S. right now, specifically because of this law, because everybody just grows and people come out of, from out of state to grow and then they try to send it back home and do. And so it just creates a whole lot of issues. Um, and so that part of the law is a change in. Um, you can possess edibles, you can possess oils. And Colorado says that uh, you cannot use it out in plain view, areas open to the general public during a manner that endangers others. So people do get arrested for using it in public. It's just a matter of having enough people to enforce it uh, some of the times. Uh, yes. Uh, he said, except in Boulder. Actually, believe it or not, Boulder wrote more tickets last year than the next closest city. Yeah, they do fully enforce this smoking in public. Denver uh, wrote an amendment to the amendment and actually allows you to sit out on your front porch and smoke it in plain view. Uh, but that's the only city that wrote an amendment. So yeah, so um, it's all about knowing the law. And people always say, well, how come they can have 420 and how come you can go to a concert and they smoke it? Well, you know, how many people were down at 420 last year? Like 80,000 people? Were there 80,000 cops? No. And so, you know, it's just control it is what it is. And so it just comes to the point where there's so many people using it, not enough to enforce it, that they just try to contain it. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the question is, is does manner that endangers others uh, have to do with secondhand smoke or other things? And, um, you know, I'm not sure exactly how they defined that. Um, I know that, uh, you know, people can smoke in the privacy of their own home and it becomes a very big problem when they live in a condominium or an apartment complex and it has shared ventilation and then it gets into the other people's buildings and it becomes a big issue. Uh, and so I'm not sure exactly how they have been enforcing endanger others. Uh, I know that there's no child endangerment yet. They had a great law that they tried to pass and it got shut down, so they're gonna try it again. So I'm not really sure what that all encompasses on a manners that endangers others. Does anybody here know? Do you have any idea with the courts, the question? So yeah, I think it's kind of broad and until you people actually, until you have municipalities actually enforcing it and setting some case law around it, I think it's gonna continue. Uh, just to be vague and people interpret it uh, how they will. Uh, and so there is uh, part of the law. And then the other part of the law says you cannot use marijuana in any form and operate a vehicle. Uh, if you get, do, you get a DUID driving under the influence of an illegal drug. Now, Colorado did pick a number, and the number is five nanograms of active THC in the system. It is a blood test, uh, and they can only test for active THC. What's interesting about the five nanograms is the science shows that impairment starts at two nanograms. And so everyone, in, people in Colorado are concerned that we're well above that impairment limit. Uh, and so if you look at the number of deaths, uh, driving under the influence accidents in Colorado, it's up like 300%. Uh, we're having a lot of issues with people uh, driving while they're high thinking that it doesn't impair them at all and then it does create a whole lot of issues so I think that will drop down because the legislators do have the right to change it and the other two states that have a limit with uh, driving have it set at two nanograms so we do have a limit you're not supposed to be driving uh, after consumption and people do uh, get arrested in large numbers in this state uh, for doing so, which uh, obviously uh, puts a big drain on a lot of our uh, resources and, and other things as well. So that's uh, part of the law there too. And just to show you how different the laws are, um, here in Colorado you can grow six plants. Washington said no. Colorado has the high in concentrates. Washington said no. Uh, medical marijuana is allowed in Colorado. Washington said no. Washington had medical marijuana dispensaries until the day it was legalized, and then all that went by the wayside. And really, that is the way it should be, because if it is all about enforcement and taxation and regulation, you don't need all these medical facilities uh, as well. 
And so uh, that is a big problem in Colorado because if you look at the number of marijuana dispensaries and marijuana facilities, the uh, edible places, the grow places, all that, there are over 500 in Colorado right now. 194 are in Denver alone. And that is a problem uh, because is marijuana easily accessible to kids today? Very accessible. And uh, when it's very accessible, where does use go, up or down? It goes up. And we're at one of the highest rates uh, of marijuana use here in Colorado. And when perception of, uh, or when uh, use goes up, where's our perception of harm go, up or down? Down. And we're at one of the lowest points uh, with marijuana being perceived as just benign and innocent and, oh, it's from Mother Earth and, oh, it's not as bad for you as that thing called alcohol. And so, you know, this is kind of a big problem as use is skyrocketing and everyone think it's, thinks it's safe. And that could be anything uh, but true. Uh, so that has a lot to do with it as well. Uh, the availability is a big problem. But look what Washington State did. They said 60 for the entire state and 8 in Seattle. And their law is very different. You don't smell any marijuana anywhere around their shops. Here in Colorado, you know, you can drive down a section of I-25 and be stoned by the time you get through it. Um, and so, uh, you know, it is just different here and people need to understand it. Uh, I need to get Alaska's up here because they just legalized it as well, I believe, um, the first week into this month. And so I've got to get that up here too. But you can see how the, the uh, laws kind of differ. But our big one is, is having medical marijuana because that just makes it so much more available with all of these things. Now, here's the impact of... Um, marijuana here in Colorado, and this is from HIDA, Rocky Mountain HIDA, that's uh, uh, the agency that gathers all of our data around drug use and, and studies and stuff that they do. Uh, we rank number fourth in the nation in teen drug use, 12 to 17 year olds. We are 39% uh, higher than the national average for marijuana use. Uh, our related exposures to accidental ingestion by kids is skyrocketing. Um, school expulsions are just out of the roof. Uh, crime, um, drug to driving incidences, hospital uh, visits, uh, treatment facilities are swamped and it's all due um, to marijuana. And in Colorado, when they asked the resource officers about what's going on in the school, 89% of them said um, they have seen a huge increase with marijuana since it was legalized. And so uh, we have a number uh, of problems with this. Yes, uh, he asked about uh, the crime regarding, uh, or regarding marijuana that's going on in the state. Uh, you know, for a while we saw a lot of these uh, dispensaries being robbed, uh, people that were growing in their own homes being robbed. I know they're getting ready to release some new information around uh, studies and stuff they've been looking at, specifically in Colorado around crime. And so off the top of my head, I, I don't know how many burglaries, how many this, how many that, murders, uh, those sorts of things. Murders probably aren't up there, um, but those sorts of things. So does that make sense? Does anybody know? I've heard that they're getting ready to release a lot of new information here coming out around a lot of this data. Uh, so does that make sense? I know we had a lot of incidences with robberies and houses being robbed and people being beat up because it's a cash only business. Uh, and so they're getting cash, they're getting the drugs and then going from there. But we have seen obviously drug driving accidents go way up, uh, you know, deaths from that as well. Does that make sense? Yes. Did you have the same question? Uh, one, two, and three, you know, I honestly don't know. I just pulled this from the Rocky Mountain Hider, and I was mad because they didn't list it. I would guess uh, probably Oregon uh, is always up there, uh, probably California, and, and Hawaii. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I would guess. I don't know if Hawaii has medical. Um, maybe Washington State. You know, when you look at per capita, you know, could be a smaller state, too. Uh, so... Yes. So does that mean that as a uh, that is what their the question was has crime increased in Colorado um, since legalization of marijuana and I think that's what they're looking at there are some studies that say yes it has and there are some studies that say no it hasn't and so they're getting to ready to release more information uh, because part of the problem is they just don't gather data properly around this when they say a crime they write the crime and they may not put as a result of someone being under the influence of marijuana or drunk or stuff like that. Does that make sense? So a lot of the data gathering is kind of skewed and lacking is a bigger word. Uh, and so I think they're getting ready to try to figure all this out. And there are groups in Denver and Denver is looking at this specifically because they're, you know, they have so many dispensaries, they're really having a lot of problems. Does that answer the questions? 
Um, so, you know, we're always learning with this and more and more information um, is coming out. But when uh, you look at medical marijuana, there's no difference between medical marijuana, recreational marijuana, and illegal marijuana being sold on the black market. Uh, marijuana is marijuana is marijuana. The old medical piece only has to do with the law. Colorado is one of the, I think it's up to 23 states now that use or allow their um, citizens to use marijuana medicinally. So it is only just a law. The drug itself, it's all the same. Here's our law right here. It's not a recommendation, it's a prescription. And you're supposed to have eight different ailments, but one of the ailments is general pain, which is huge. Uh, and so a lot of things fall under that. Um, you can possess now two ounces of marijuana instead of one. And the biggest thing is, is you don't have a 25% tax that recreational has. Um, so it is cheaper. Uh, and so more and more people are getting medical cards and you're losing out on the taxation piece of the recreational. So it is just the law and the, the medical law is a totally separate law than Amendment 64 uh, and they don't really have a whole lot to do uh, with each other. And so there's the medical law, but the thing about it is everyone gets really upset because marijuana is a Schedule One drug under federal law, which means it's uh, treated at the same level as heroin and, and ecstasy and some other drugs. And the only reason that it is listed as such is because you can't dose the plant material. For something to be considered outside of a Schedule One drug under federal law, you have to be able to dose it, and you, actually, you have to have data on how much of a dose is for medicinal use. Does that make sense? And so when you look at the marijuana plant, every bud on the plant is different. Every strand of marijuana has a different amount in the buds. So you can't just pull a marijuana bud and, and say, okay, this is exactly how much is there because there's too many variables. Does that make sense? Now, um, we are getting more and more data around marijuana as medicine. But, you know, until within the last two or three years, every study looking at marijuana was all about harm. Not one study has been done looking at marijuana as medicine. And so we need a lot more uh, data in this state. The governor did open up about $9 million a few years ago for the doctors in this state to start specifically looking at marijuana as medicine. And they have started doing it around the world too. And they're, you know, trying to figure out, you know, it, what is it in the plant that, that makes it beneficial? You know, what is, uh, you know, not helping some people and why? And so we do need a whole lot more studies around this. But like I said earlier, the CBD, the cannabidiol is showing a lot of medicinal promise and it's just going to be a matter of time uh, before we get um, any data to figure it all out. But what a lot of people don't understand is we already have a number of prescription drugs out there that have the marijuana compounds in them. And one is Marinol. That's been a pill that's been around forever. It was very popular in the 80s with AIDS. Uh, people would be giving it to them to help keep food down. Uh, so that they could start to feel better. A lot of people didn't like it though because it's a pill and as soon as you swallow a pill they'd be vomiting it back up. And so, you know, this one we do have a lot of data about. It's called Marinol and those are the things that it kind of relieves there. Well, they came out with a film strip that dissolves on the tongue because people were complaining about swallowing a pill because it came right back up. And um, this uh, seems to work as well for pain and nausea and also some uh, information on fibromyalgia. And then there's Sativex, which we're waiting. This is in its third human study here uh, in the United States. It's gone through animal studies. It is already a prescription drug in all other parts of the world. Here in the U.S., we're waiting for it to clear, but they say it will very, very soon. Uh, and it's a breast spray that you just spray on your tongue. And this stuff actually comes uh, from a uh, doctor in Israel who's been growing all different strands of marijuana and extracting out different cannabinoids and doing studies on them. And so this stuff is derived straight from the cannabis plant. Uh, these two are synthetics. Um, and so they're trying to see, does that benefit as well? And it is showing a lot of promise with uh, muscle spasticity, some pain, and then some people are having benefit with seizures. So there are prescription uh, marijuana compounds out there that are a prescription drug. Um, and the good thing about it is we have data on it. The stuff that the guy down in Colorado Springs prescribes and other people go and get it um, and use it medicinally, we don't have a lot of data as to exactly how all that is looking. And so there's no controlled studies around it. People just go and buy it and use it for pain and it helps or it doesn't. You know, nausea, it helps or it doesn't. So um, there are prescriptions out there that do have THC and other cannabinoids in it. 
And so um, here's an interesting fact that a lot of people don't understand about marijuana is that THC is our only fat soluble drug, meaning it doesn't like your bloodstream, it likes your body fat. Um, so after you smoke it or you vape it or you drink it in a soda or eat it in a cookie, THC gets in the bloodstream, travels around the whole body, and your body fat sucks it up. Your organ fat sucks it up, and your brain fat sucks it up as well. And you can see the more often you use, the longer it can stay there. And so it's usually a good 30 days, uh, sometimes longer. But now daily use, at least three times a day every day, really pumps that number up. And so this is the one drug that you can fail a drug test on longer than any other drug out there. And, you know, that creates a problem in the area for, of employment um, because both our medical marijuana law and Amendment 64 both state in the law employers don't have to accommodate your use of marijuana in the workplace, period. And so people would go to work high, they'd go to work uh, with their card and say, you can't fire me, I'm medicating. And they were promptly fired and a lot of those people sued and it did set case law in Colorado and it says that employers have the right to refuse to hire and can fire at will anyone using marijuana medicinally, recreationally or otherwise in the workplace. And that goes for showing up high or failing a random drug test. And so in this one you have a high probability of failing a random uh, days later uh, because of the way it is stored in your body fat. So, you know, everything about this drug is uh, different. There's your duration, your high, how long it can stay in your system, but it is our fat soluble drug. And um, the fat soluble piece of it is the active THC being broke down into the carboxylic acid form of THC, and that is what's stored in the fat. And so with the driving thing, all they can test for is active THC, and it has to be a blood test. This is urine, and it's that fat soluble uh, form of THC. Um, and so there's a, a problem with employment, not only in Colorado, but really across the nation uh, with this uh, drug. Now here are the different types of material, and we'll talk about it and how they consume it. Obviously, you know the plant material, yes. Uh, the question is, uh, the duration of the high is two to three minutes, and does our high end THC in these products today uh, increase the duration of the high or just make it more intense? Okay, so uh, the answer is yes to both of those. Uh, it gets very, very intense and it can last longer. Uh, you see a lot more uh, agitation and other things that we never saw before. So the duration of high can be longer and much more intense because of the potency. Does that make sense? So that would extend potentially your... Um, it could extend... They say, you know, I've read some conflicting things. Some things have said six hours with active THC. Some have said nine or ten. Uh, they say usually by 24 hours after you last consumed it, it should be well below, you know, two nanograms, um, even at the higher concentrations. Because once it gets into the system, our body starts to break it down. And that's when it breaks it into the, to the carboxylic acid that's stored in the fat. Does that make sense? So yeah, but it is, it can be much longer and, and just come on very, very fast uh, and different today. So there's our um, different uh, forms and we'll talk about them. Now this is your marijuana concentrates uh, that they extract out. A lot of them extract it out with butane. If you guys heard of butane hash oil extractions, house is blowing up from it because butane is extremely volatile. There are about three or four different types of ways that you could extract it. Butane is very fast, but it's very uh, flammable and a lot of houses blow up because of it. Here's your BHO, they call it butane honey oil, um, and that is what they will put in the edibles as well. Um, it can be a wax uh, in a gooey and uh, waxy looking stuff, and they say uh, the more yellow or translucent it is, the higher the THC. A lot of times they'll take the wax and spread it out on cheesecloth, and then uh, it dries a little bit, and then they peel off these big pieces, and that's called shatter and they call it shatter, bless you, because it breaks, it shatters, and you could drop it and it shatters. Um, it's very, very potent stuff. Here's the hashish uh, and the keef, and usually how they make that today is they'll buy, the mara, buy marijuana, usually the buds, uh, crush it up, uh, put it, uh, or can even put it in whole in a big five-gallon bucket and throw in a piece of dry ice, and then put a piece of cheesecloth over it and uh, put a rubber band or some rope or something around it to hold it very tight and the dried ice starts freeze drying that resin off and they turn it upside down and shake it. And then they get a really, really fine uh, green powder and then they collect it all up. And you can 
put it in molds. Uh, they'll collect it all up and start rolling it and your body heat starts getting it gooey. Uh, and so they'll roll balls of it sometimes. Um, but it's very, very concentrated. It's not like, you know, uh, when I was a kid, hashish looked like dirt with plant material in it. Um, it doesn't look like that today. If anyone older here in the room remembers that, it was very, it's very different than it looks today. This is very, very potent stuff. And they do call it dabs because a dab will do you. Uh, they say one puff of this potent stuff uh, equals smoking two full joints. Um, so it is very, very potent. And I talk to kids um, and adults all the time that say, yeah, once you start dabbing, you know, smoking the flour, just a joint, just doesn't do it for you anymore. So it is very potent. I'll pass this stuff around. You guys can look at it. Um, I bought it down in the pot shops. Um, a bunch of cops and I were checking things out. They wanted to um, test some of this stuff, and so we went down and bought a bunch of it. Um, this stuff is called butter, um, and it looks like plumber's putty. Um, but uh, if you put your hand, put some in your hands and roll it, your body heat makes it real gooey and sticky, and then you could smoke it in a vaporizer. And then here's the really, really high-end stuff. It won all kinds of awards. And this is your shatter, and it's got kind of <laughs> warm and stuck to the wall here, but you can see right through it. It's very, very potent stuff. Um, so that's what some of the concentrates in the state um, look like. And then they smoke it in the vaporizers or vapes, the e-cigarettes, um, the hookah pens. Um, here's a vaporizer. All these were given to me by a school. Uh, schools are taking them out of, out of the schools like crazy, middle schools, high schools. And this is a vaporizer, and it got broken. It got, uh, I think I had some counselors that were really excited at the first training after they gave it to me, and they all got broke. Um, but it has this little thing on it, and you can get some wax, um, concentrate, and just roll a little ball on there and then put um, the top piece on and it doesn't all go together because it got broken. Um, let's see if we can get it to go. And then you just push the button that um, heats it and then it vaporizes it and they smoke it out the top. Uh, the question is, does it have the same smell as marijuana? Not always. Um, you know, it makes just a vapor. They push the button and breathe it in. Uh, here's an e-cigarette or another vaporizer, hookah pen, you know, they can use. Uh, these hookah pens and stuff, they can buy the e-drops that are flavored to put in here, and they have vegetable oil in. Vegetable oil is fatty. THC is fatty. Fat and fat like fat. So they put it in here, push the button, light turns on, you can hear crackling, and then um, they smoke it. And when they exhale, if it smells like orange, like this one smells like orange, uh, the odor coming out is orange. Uh, odor. So you don't always get a marijuana smell with it. A lot of times you'll get like a fruity smell or another smell because if they're putting the liquid in the drop in the e-drops, um, then it, uh, you know, all kind of just doesn't smell like marijuana. So I'll pass these around. And what a lot of kids will do, here's another one. This one does smell like orange. You can push the button. It works. It cracks. It's almost burned out from people testing it. But uh, the schools tell me all the time that kids will smoke these. Um, when they have a substitute teacher a lot of times or in the classroom until the teachers catch on but they'll wear a watch or they'll wear a hoodie and they'll sit like this in class and very little smoke and they're smoking in the classrooms um, and so you know people smoke these at the uh, airport they smoke them while they're driving uh, they smoke them all over town uh, everywhere that you can think of in the hospitals um, and so, you know, it doesn't leave a lot of marijuana odor to it. Um, and so that's a way to disguise it too. So there's a, another vape and you guys can look at them, take them apart, play with them, uh, do whatever. So, um, all these are out there. This is, um, a vaporizer too. Why would they make it look like an inhaler? To disguise it, right? And I know a number of kids in the high schools who get harassed because they actually have asthma and they're seen taking a hit of it after a gym class, and then the SRO and the security team is down, pulling them out, calling their parents, calling the doctor, calling the pharmacy to confirm that it's really uh, for asthma. So uh, all kinds of things go on. You can get them rechargeable here. Um, this is from a high school. Uh, took it out of the kid's pocket uh, and uh, got in a whole lot of trouble. Here's the hookah pens that you could smoke it into, the e-cigarettes that you take apart, you can smoke it in. Um, they can smoke it out of bongs or bubblers as they call them. Uh, they call them oil rigs, uh, dab pipes. Um, they have little nail looking things on them and they'll heat that nail with a blowtorch and then just hit that waxy stuff on it and phew, vaporizes very, very quickly. And then they breathe it in, you know, suck it in via whatever liquid there and then just blow it out. 
Um, so, you know, these dab pipes and oilers are very, very popular as well. Here's a homemade one that looks really funky. I figure if you got money for Grey Goose, Grey Goose, you might as well, you know, make a nice marijuana pipe out of it. Um, and so uh, a lot of homemade things as well that you'll see. Uh, but these are their oil rigs or their bubblers that they smoke these high-end concentrates in. And then um, as far as the edibles, um, you know, it is everything that you can think of. And we're going to talk about these uh, as well. And uh, these edibles first started in the medical marijuana dispensaries. And one thing about medical marijuana, the science does show to get benefit from it, you need to eat it. Ingesting works so much better. You know, smoking, you know, smoking everything we know is bad for you. So eating it is the big thing. And so it did start in the marijuana dispensaries. But the thing about it is all this stuff is supposed to be tested in Colorado in the recreational pot shops from seed to finished product for THC content, for mold, for fungus, for bacteria, for pesticides. If they're growing the marijuana in dirt, they has to have to test it for soil contaminants as well. Well, they're just now starting to get the labs up and operating 15 months into this. So we haven't had a lot of testing like should have been done from day one. Um, and so you don't really know what kind of contaminants are in this marijuana. And medical marijuana does not have that standard, which I think they should, especially if we're gonna extract it out and give it to parents to give to their little kids for seizing. Shouldn't we be able to tell a parent 100% of what's in there? We should, and that's a different law. And so, um, you know, uh, medical marijuana does not have the same standards as recreationally, and we're still trying to get this fully up and operating and enforced and regulated the way it needs to be regulated. And so let's look at states that actually do testing, okay? Here's what the information that Washington released. In the last six months of legalization, they found 13% of their pot had E. coli, salmonella, and mold in it. Is E. coli and salmonella good for us? No, uh, they're deadly bacteria, but at least they are testing and they can get it off the market and not ever allow it on the market through testing. Colorado, it's user beware. California did testing and they found less THC than the products claimed. 40% had mold and mildew and 15% of the oils had benzene. What is benzene? Benzene is a cancer causing chemical and not good for us humans. Uh, and so, you know, um, we still have a long way to go and we need to get this testing done. Uh, but right now it's used to be well, and it was passed in the law because it is a safety, a health and safety issue. Um, yeah. uh, they're supposed to be, well, uh, potency, uh, they don't have for testing, but you have to tell them how much THC is in the product. Does that make sense? And so I'll show you that in just a minute and walk you through it because that all changed just recently too with the change in the law. Uh, does that answer your question? So yeah, so we'll get with potency and figuring it out. Um, and so uh, we do have deaths associated now with marijuana use. So we've had a number of them. And these are the two first ones that happened that went worldwide. Um, the one where the 19 year old kid came down, ate a marijuana cookie, got very agitated. His friends took him back to the hotel, tried to calm him down got agitated, went to the balcony and jumped off and they were four stories up and it was the fall and hit on the ground that killed him. Uh, but when they released his toxicology, he had like 600 milligrams of THC in his system. And so, uh, you know, is it one cookie? Is it multiple cookies? Was he vaping? We'll never know. Uh, and so a sad story and then another sad story that you guys probably remember, the guy down in Denver who um, was on uh, eating marijuana caramels, got agitated. His wife is on the phone with Denver Dispatch 911 for 12 full minutes, and they never responded. And then the last thing you hear is a blood-curdling scream and a gunshot, and he shot his wife at point-blank range in front of the kids. Um, and so we're starting to hear about that. That was just on the news. I think on Friday they said the guy's pleading not guilty, and his case is set for June or July. Um, and so the grandparents filed a lawsuit because the kids are, you know, obviously never going to be the same. Uh, and so, you know, we'll see what happens, but we do have a number of deaths here in Colorado um, regarding uh, marijuana. Is it the marijuana or are they getting some chemicals that we have no idea what they are? Uh, and so until we get things tested and regulated, we're really kind of uh, rolling with it as we go. Now, the thing about marijuana edibles is, obviously there's probably an inconsistency in the concentration, but anytime you eat a product, it's time delayed. Uh, whether you're popping prescription pills or 
having a marijuana cookie or an edible or popping molly. Um, to, you know, it's got to go through the entire digestive tract into the lower intestine and then it pops out uh, into the bloodstream. And that can take a good 30 to 60 minutes. But people don't know that. And so they'll eat some of these edibles, not feel what they think they should be feeling. And what do they do? They eat more. And that is the worst thing you could do because now you're double dosing. And that is a huge, huge problem. The information needs to get out on how to consume marijuana. And we don't have a lot of science on eating marijuana. We don't have any science on what happens when you put THC in food and cook it uh, or start mixing it with other things. There's no science around that at all. And so we just need a lot more information. But it is a time delayed thing. People do uh, eat more. And then by the time it comes to fruition, all kinds of craziness starts going on. Um, so there's some information about the edibles. And here are some of the edibles. Now when I say edible, I want you guys to think of every food product that you can think of because that's exactly what it is. It's everything. Um, they take the THC oil, they mix it with butter, they call it butter, and they take that butter and they make cookies and candies and cakes and pie and ice cream and yogurt and chocolate truffles. I was in one place, they were popping popcorn and drizzling THC butter on the popcorn and people were buying bags of popcorn and eating it. Um, it is everything you can think of. It is every drink. They now make beer and coffee along with energy drinks, tea, juices, um, uh, sodas. Uh, it is everything that you can think of. Have you heard of people having pot lucks where they put the pot in the pot luck? Have you heard about those? All kinds of stories uh, around that. Uh, and so, you know, there's even a chef, I guess, who gave up her job somewhere else in, in the U.S. and comes here and on the weekends does these THC infusion parties uh, where she makes high-end meals and infuses it all with marijuana and they pay a hefty price to go there. Um, so, you know, it could be absolutely anything. And for those of you that are 21 or older in this room, I would strongly recommend you go visit a pot shop because you can. You need to see exactly what goes on in there. It will blow your mind, the stuff that they have in there and how it is so marketed to our kids. And so you need to go in them to see what is available because the kids know. The kids know more about marijuana today than their parents. And it's hard for parents to have a conversation with them, especially when the parents think it's, oh, you know, that wacky weed, man, it was so fun, it didn't hurt anybody when I was in college. Well, that's not the stuff today. And so you need to go into a pot shop to see really what it's all about. Um, so it is absolutely everything. And uh, they can infuse products, meaning they take products that people recognize and then infuse it and resell it. A lot of times it smells of marijuana. Um, sometimes you don't know until you taste it. It's going to taste a little weird. Um, so, you know, it could be anything. Uh, and, you know, they don't change the look of it. So, you know. It uh, is stuff that people recognize, and, and then they cost a pretty penny. So those are just some of them. But now let's go through ones that I actually bought in the pot shops. Here's one, and, and they sold me a medical product, and that's kind of not supposed to be going on in the recreational pot shops. Recreational has very, very specific things that have to be on that label. And um, at the time of buying this, I'll need to go out and buy some new ones. Um, that was not being enforced or followed. Um, now, it says you can have 100 milligrams of activated THC. And until um, May of last year, they passed a law, but it went into the effect, I think, earlier this month. Um, it was you could have a maximum of 100 milligrams of THC in any product total. So that, that kind of answers a little bit of your question earlier when you asked about testing for it. So that is the maximum amount they can put in any product. Um, now, the word activated is on there because that lets people know that THC has been activated, so if they eat it, they're going to get high, okay? And to get high, you have to heat THC to activate it, hence smoking, vaping, baking, stirring in really hot butter activates THC, and so even though it's going to be lukewarm or cold, you know, or it's a soda that I'm drinking, if the THC is activated, I'm going to get stoned. Make sense? Now, I say that because this is a medicinal product. And people that truly use marijuana medicinally, do they want to be stoned out of their mind? No. So there are products that you can buy that don't have the word activated on it. And that tells people that they're not going to get high. That's going to be more of a sedating kind of thing. Does that make sense? And so that's just a code word. Well, that's all fine and good. But uh, according to the law, you couldn't have more than 10 milligrams per serving. 
So if this has 100 milligrams total, this should say somewhere on the label, this is 10 servings. You need to divide that into 10 pieces. Does that happen? No, and especially when you read the labeling. It says dosage suggestion is one half to one crisp per three hours or as needed. So if they follow the guidance of the dosage and they eat half of it, could they be in trouble? But if they don't feel the effects, you know, 20, 30, 40 minutes in, what do they do? Eat the other half. And then are they going to have problems? Probably. So start to see some of the problems here. And what we're dealing with with these edibles is we have to get people educated. It is time delayed and it needs to be cut into pieces or you need to be told, you know, have one tenth of this, start with a little bit. And then if you like it, then certainly have a little more. Yes. What's couch? Oh, couch lock. Uh, people that smoke pot, are they very motivated? Not always, right? So they're sitting just on the couch, just zoning. Couch lock is what they call it. Have you kids heard of couch lock? Um, so uh, it's just a code word um, that it makes them really lazy, I guess would be a good way to put it. Um, and so, you know, that product is out there. Here's another fun one. They take um, the Chex Mix, the Muddy Buddies, and they spray it with THC oil. And then they repackage it up as Buddy Mix. And this bag says 100 milligrams total of THC. So how many servings should it be? There's nothing on there about to eat a tenth of this. And so I'll pass this around, see if it has any odor to it. It used to stink. Oh, yeah, you can still get a little odor of marijuana. It smells like chocolate and peanut butter as well, but you guys can open it up. Uh, that's some of it there. And you can see how the color, all the sugariness is kind of going away because they spray it with the THC oil. So you're going to get a little marijuana odor. It's probably going to taste uh, weird, too, um, as you get that oil. Um, so there's another one out there. Here's a fun one. Pixie sticks. And so if the label's not on here, is your kid going to know? Are you going to have a clue? No. And so when you look at it, there was less than a tablespoon of sugar in here when I took it out. Uh, it uh, smells a tiny bit like marijuana. It smelled like blueberry sugar. It probably has more of a marijuana smell now as people have been opening it uh, and shaking it. Uh, but the bad news is that says 75 milligrams. So this is seven and a half servings. Do you divide your pixie sticks in seven? No, I would eat seven pixie sticks when I was a kid. So you can open that and smell it and read the label. Here's another fun one. Do you have a clue? You got to guess, right? If it's in a bowl at a party, do you have a clue? No. And so all I did was buy some, get a bag of Swedish fish, put it out, take them out, and go. All this guy does, I call him Mr. Ed up here, he buys every Haribo candy, and I mean every Haribo candy, sprays it with THC oil, repackages it, and sells it. So these reek of marijuana. The odor's kind of gone down, but it smelled like a skunk. And code word for marijuana today is skunk because it smells so god-awfully bad. Um, and so it would just knock you over when you open these. So you are going to get an odor to it. Um, and uh, I'll pass these around. You guys can open it up, smell it. Here's the fish. Uh, I'll pass around some other candies as well. There's some gummies, um, bears. Uh, that's two servings. Um, the rope here is supposed to be five. That says 100 milligrams, 10, 10 milligram pieces, so one fish is one serving. Does only, does, do people only eat one fish? No, anybody that knows anything with Swedish fish is a bag is a serving. And so, you know, it becomes a problem. Thank you for waiting. And you don't. And until they get the testing set and really start regulating it, I don't know that we're going to know. Uh, but, yeah, it is potent, potent stuff that they spray on there. You know, probably 80, 90 percent THC. And then how, you know, uh, do they spray it the same way every time? Does everyone have their own little procedure? Does, you know, the, somebody do it real carefully and one just go, you know, spray over? We don't know any of that. And so, you know, we just need more, you know, information and really need to regulate this and get it under control. Was that kind of your question, yeah. too? I saw you had your hand up. Yeah. And if it's not being tested there, you know, have that, has that been confirmed through testing? Right. Right. And so, yeah. yeah he Does he have a lot of caution on it? Yeah, it, has, it hasn't been tested. Caution. Oh, so he does put it on. Okay, good, this, interesting. This, this marijuana product. Yeah, <laughs> the marijuana product, something. We'll get one of the kids to read it. Yeah. 
this is used with caution. Yeah, and it's supposed to have specific labeling on, don't use it in drive, don't use it if you're pregnant. Um, it's kind of gone away. It really smelled. I'll have to go buy some new ones. Uh, yes, the question is uh, if they were to eat all of it instead of the proper serving size, um, and especially if a little kid got a hold of it, could it be lethal and create a lot of problems? And it does. And I'll uh, show you how the law changed here and why. And it's specifically because the doctors at Children's Hospital, because the number of kids that were getting accidental exposure and being put in the intensive care unit and admitted to Children's Hospital. Um, treatment providers tell me all the time, treatment doctors, detox doctors tell me all the time that a lot of these people are really struggling. And so many of them are taking up beds in the detox facilities for days with marijuana because of this high potency THC can give them psychosis and antipsychotics don't touch it. Xanax doesn't touch it. A lot of issues with a racing heart. The heart races anywhere from 20 to 100 times it should um, within uh, uh, shortly after consuming and can last for three hours. Um, and so, you know, we see a lot of negative effects that we never saw before. So like I said at the beginning, we're kind of rolling with it, but we know that it's creating a lot of problems and, and, it, and it does put a huge bill on the medical community. Can it actually kill you? Because I've heard people say that, like, you can't overdose on marijuana. You know, and that, that's an interesting thing. The question is, can it kill you? And I can tell you that if you saw the coroner on TV after the kid jumped off the balcony, uh, she said that they're believing more and more that you can overdose if you ingest it. And she wrote right on the death certificate, I guess, that uh, THC, you know, she wrote that it was uh, fall to the ground, whatever, blunt force impact or whatever it's called on the death certificate um, due to marijuana use. Now, I know that THC is not an option on a death certificate. So in my opinion, how can you really say that if it's not an option? Things that are an option is heroin, uh, cocaine, alcohol, uh, heart attacks, stroke, cancer. Those are things that are on there, and marijuana and THC is not, and so how do you really gauge that? And so, you know, to answer your question is all I know is that more and more doctors are saying they think that now that it might be possible, but it's not an option on a death certificate. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, uh, and we're seeing, you know, deaths associated with it. Um, so, yeah, so, you know, time will tell. Right, but do they know they're supposed to eat, you know, one-tenth of the cupcake? Um, no, but I can tell you those uh, candies that went around, the, the Mr. Edipure, that was like $28. Um, the, um, the first thing I showed you, that uh, um, Rice Krispie Treat thing, I think that was like $32. Um, I got more candy to send around. The, it was right around there, but you know, a good chunk of it was 25% tax, uh, too. The marijuana, the... Uh, high-end um, concentrate back there, the wax, was $100 for that little bit. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it is expensive, but that tax puts a big chunk on it as well. Does that make sense? I, well, I want to be more expensive, so let's just forget it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, but, you know, put your money in and, and if they know. So, yeah. Did you have another question, or is that similar? No? Oh, okay. All right. Um, so yeah, so there's that. Here's another fun one. This one's a little easier to tell. That's definitely a peanut butter cup. Uh, but uh, you know, again, proper labeling, uh, packaging, uh, all that, making sure it's in a childproof container, uh, all that becomes an issue. But the bad news, 10 servings. You're going to divide that in nine and have someone lick the knife? Probably not. And so here it is, I'll pass it around. It's kind of, uh, it really, it didn't smell, it smelled like candy until we broke it open, broke little chunks off the sides to test it with the cops. Uh, so you will get a marijuana odor. Um, I'll pass it around for you guys to look at. Here's some caramels. And the reason I bought this one is because it's the only one that the labeling is actually correct um, out of the ones I bought. It tells you how many servings and everything about it. Uh, if you dare, you can open it up and reach in here. Uh, it smells of marijuana. It's got oil everywhere. Um, this gets soft in my car. These are two pieces that kind of stuck together. Each piece is five servings. Uh, and so um, this is here, but it is the proper labeling. Uh, and it says um, so all over it. So uh, get all that oil on you. So there's um, that one. Well, that's 10 servings of THC. 
here's your 10 servings of peanut butter cups. And if you eat 10 servings of either, are you going to have a few problems? <laughs> a tiny bit, right? So you guys uh, see the problems that it's creating. Now, the law changed last May, and it was forced by the doctors at Children's Hospital. Because in the first two years medical marijuana dispensaries were open, there were 14 kids under the age of 12 that had accidental ingestion of these edibles, and they were taken to Children's Hospital. Eight of those kids were admitted to the hospital. Two were put in the intensive care unit, and the youngest child was eight months old. Prior to this being available in our medical marijuana dispensaries is where all the edibles started, there were zero through the history of time. But these edibles, are they marketed to kids? They are. And so the law is supposed to change. And the new law says now that you can only sell 10 milligrams. You can only sell one serving. And if you make something that is more than one serving, you have to cut it into the proper pieces, packages, package it up, label it. You can only sell 10 milligrams, one serving at a time. Well, the law went farther and said, you need to color it and make it distinguishable because I showed you guys, once you take it out, any of it out of the package, do you have a clue? No. And so they're supposed to color it. And when I was down there, the legislators kept saying, let's make it an ugly gray. And, uh, you know, they want to make it so it's not appealing to kids. Um, they went as far as saying, well, let's put an insignia right on the edible itself because once you take it out of the packaging, you can't tell. But if you have this gray thing and it's got a little red X or a little green marijuana leaf on it, now you can tell little kids, do you see this thing? You don't eat it. You tell mommy and daddy, you leave, you get out of there. You can tell teenagers because it's showing up at parties like crazy. Are the edibles showing up at parties? They are showing up like crazy at parties. And so you can know if you see this, you know it has a drug in it if it comes from the dispensaries. Um, and they're saying if you can't color it and put an insignia on it, you can't sell it. But that has yet to happen. In fact, they are fighting it big time, tooth and nail, and they don't want to have to color these because it's going to cost money. But I believe more importantly, it's less appealing to the kids. Um, and so, you know, I can't remember the last time I bought a pixie stick. And I am not in to gummies. So, you know, who's it really marketed to? And so that's the way the law is supposed to be, but they are getting huge kickback. They have changed it and made it 10 milligrams per serving, one serving per packet, but the colorization and the identification has yet to happen, and they are fighting it tooth and nail. This week there's going to be a big hearing down with the legislators all around what are we going to do with this because the law says one thing, but they are not enforcing it or you know doing what they need to do. So when you hear about these edibles, the products really are everything that, again, you can think of. They have patches that people wear, and some people do wearing, wear them medicinally. You can get them in the recreational shops, pills, you can get the mints. You can get lotions and tinctures. You can get oil. You can get honey. You can get butter, um, everything. And so that's why you guys need to go into these shops just to see uh, everything that's out there. But my favorite is this. This has 21 milligrams of THC in it, and really, what is the purpose? It smells, smell it, it smells just like um, chapstick. It has uh, cinnamon, or peppermint oil in it, very high-end ingredients, everything organic, and this goes around the schools. Uh, they take the label off, and kids pass it around and put it on their lips, and here we go. What really is the purpose of having marijuana in your lip balm? Does anybody know? I'd love an explanation. Money. What? Kissing, yeah, there you go. Uh, so yeah, um, so you know it is everything, and so you guys need to check this out. But uh, so many different products out there, and it's really a smorgasbord, um, and just more and more people, you know, coming here to open these businesses to make even more and more and more. So um, all this uh, goes on out there, and it's every product you can think of. Now here's some of your short-term and, and long-term effects. And uh, you know, drugs can really be across the board on everything. With this one, we do see the basic, um, you know, the laziness, the, the in, increase in appetite, the very dry mouth, feeling better, real relaxed. We do see stimulant type effects um, where the heart races out of control, very, very agitated. Uh, it does impair their coordination uh, as well. And you see anxiety and confusion. Uh, short term with this as well. And then the long term issues. And this stuff was presented to the legislators just um, 
a few weeks ago saying that it does impair the mental status, specifically learning memory, math and reading achievement, even 28 days uh, after they stop using. And then the psychosis, um, the agitation, panic attacks, um, just uh, behavior uh, that we have never seen before. So there's some of your um, short and long term, and I sent a handout um, to you and to, I think, Carolyn. Um, so if you guys want it, you can email me, I'll send it to you, or do you have it for them, you can send it to them? or. Um, so yeah, so you can send it out and it has all of the information and all the science and all the data uh, on it as well. Uh, and here's your short and long term effects. But again, uh, everybody is affected differently. What are you using? How are you using it? How much you're using? What is in it? All these sorts of things all kind of play a role. Um, now, here's your indicators of marijuana use. Uh, and um, these are just uh, a number of them. Uh, and you can see here, lack of conversions, they can't cross their eyes, they get the reddening of the eyes. Um, now they have to call out a DRE expert, a drug recognition expert, to figure out if they are under the influence for adults here in Colorado. Um, they'll look at, uh, you know, errors in judgment, um, changing emotions, erratic behavior, you know, people have an I don't care attitude uh, with marijuana. And I think anytime you deal with anybody high on any drug, it can be a safety issue because you really never know how anyone's really going to react or respond. And so I think it's always better just to wait until people come down off the drug um, and then deal with them. So there are some of your indicators and all that, uh, again, is on the handout. Now, um, there's a lot of science, very, very solid science around marijuana, and we're not going to talk about all this today just due to time, uh, but it is all in the handout uh, as far as chronic use with marijuana today and the solid scientific studies. But we will talk about uh, a few of them. And uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is the brain. Now, in our head, we have what's called an endocannabinoid system, and it's a very, very, very valuable part of our brain. And our brain releases endocannabinoids multiple times during the day. These endocannabinoids are a very, very small particulate, and our brain releases a very minuscule amount. And then they go throughout the bloodstream, and we have CB1, CB2, and G protein couplers in the brain and on various organs. And when they bind on these receptors, they flash which means they burn very, very intensely, and then they cause a response. Well, one thing that they do is they get our central nervous system into homeostasis, meaning gets all our chemicals into balance, um, and you know that's very important because when your brain chemistry is out of balance, that can be a very dangerous health effect. Um, it helps when we're stressed. It helps when we're sick. It helps with learning and memory. But the number one thing it does for kids is it helps their brain grow to the size and weight it needs to be at maturity when it's done somewhere around the age of 25, 26, 29, whenever that time is. And so that's the natural response of our endocannabinoid system. Well, cannabinoid, those are what's in marijuana. And so this is where THC, CBD and all these other cannabinoids bind. But it's a very, very dark side with marijuana. If I was in here and had, you know, broke open some of that pot back there and we put it in a vaporizer and we all vape some, we're going to have a large amount of THC in our bloodstream. And it is going to go and it's going to bind to these receptors. But is THC larger or smaller than our man made endocannabinoids? Larger, much larger. So when they bind on these receptors, they don't flash. They burn for hours. And the science shows that it starts damaging these receptors. And the science does show that it delays brain growth and development. And if you delay your brain growth and development, when your brain is done, you know, at 25, 27, whenever it is, does the brain go back and compensate for when you messed it up as a teenager? No. And so, you know, there is a very, very dark side with marijuana. And so, you know, there's reputable science out there, and it's not looking like a real good thing, especially for the developing adolescent brain. Now, here's a picture of the brain. When you cut it in half, here are all the parts. In the middle of our head is our reward center surrounded by our limbic system. That is the midbrain, and that is the only part of an adolescent brain that's fully formed. It fully forms by the age of 13. The rest isn't going to be developed until about the age of 25, maybe a little later. Frontal lobe prefrontal cortex here in front of the head, and if you could stick your fingers up above your eyes, is your higher end thinking part of your brain, executive functioning, problem solving, decision making, knowing right from wrong, learning the difference between good and bad, learning from your mistakes, um, judgment, cognition, impulse control, emotions, and language is up there as well. And this is one of the last part of the brains. 
brain that is fully formed. It kind of goes a little slow. Top of the head, movement, sensation, and motivation is the top. Back is vision. There's your coordination. That is your cerebellum. That is your brainstem responsible for breathing. And in the middle of our head is our hippocampus. That deals with learning and memory, especially working memory, being able to lay down a memory, and then recall that memory at a period of time later. Now I'm going to show you guys where THC binds in the brain. So what is the only part of the brain not impaired from marijuana use? It is the vision, all in the back of the head here. You know, and THC damages these receptors. We wrote in the law that you can't use marijuana and operate a vehicle, and that's because the studies since 1950 on have shown that it does impair the ability. The new studies say now the higher the THC, the bigger the problem. Uh, and, you know, we talked about that, how the number of drug driving incidences are up uh, here and across the nation. Makes you feel good, but do some people use drugs so that they don't have to feel at all? Maybe they have some things going on in their lives. They don't know how to talk about it. They're not comfortable in their own skin. Something's going on. Will drugs suppress all of those bad feelings? They do. So feelings have a lot to do uh, with why people use drugs. Learning and memory part of the brain, frontal lobe, prefrontal cortex, top of the brain uh, as well. And so, you know, the science is very, very clear. And there is excellent, reputable science out there that has been reproduced, multiple studies that are epidemiological studies. Um, and, you know, it impairs the frontal lobe, drops the IQ. One of the studies shows uh, drops it by an average of six to eight points, and the IQ doesn't return to normal, um, and a link between marijuana and mental illness. Uh, and so, you know, all the studies are right there. Even the um, Journal, uh, New England Journal of Medicine came out and analyzed all the data that was out there and came up with uh, all kinds of information on about how this is a drug that the longer kids stay away from, really, during these teen years, the better off they're going to be. And so uh, good science that's out there, and it's hard to argue with science. Um, new study showing that uh, chronic use causes this fiery red gingivitis. What it does is the immune system kind of weakens, damages the... Um, uh, the gums, the gums loosen the teeth, and then the teeth start falling out. And if they're using a lot, um, you know, as a teenager in their early 20s, even at earlier ages, you'd think tooth loss might be older, even in the teens and late teens and early 20s um, can have some tooth loss as well um, from chronic use of this. Um, and so a lot of good information out there around how it affects uh, different organs in the body. Um, the heart, uh, or the Hyperemesis syndrome is probably the number one thing that doctors want to talk about when I do trainings with uh, emergency room docs and nurses. It's this cyclic vomiting where it's kind of interesting because THC is supposed to prevent you from vomiting. But chronic use makes these people sick in a cyclic manner. And the doctors and nurses tell me all the time, oh yeah, every Thursday we just expect so and so and here he or she is and it's cyclic so they vomit every Thursday. Or if they only vomit a couple times a month, they vomit a couple times a month. A month later, exact dates, they're back in the hospital from vomiting, from being dehydrated and so sick. So there's this cyclic um, vomiting that goes on. They say if you just give them a warm bath, that kind of calms them down. Um, some anti-nausea medicine will help a little bit, but um, this is becoming a bigger, bigger problem in our emergency rooms. Uh, another issue is the heart and how much the heart uh, rate increases and the, now the potential for a heart attack from this high-end marijuana as well. Uh, and so again, a lot of new things popping up uh, around marijuana uh, out there. And so the heart is another thing that they want to talk about all the time uh, when I talk to doctors and nurses is how do you calm that heart down. Um, vision uh, is affected and they're seeing some long-term issues with that and that's because we have CB1 receptors on our retina. So they say that's an extension of that endocannabinoid system that we talked about, uh, and it damages those receptors. And then you have, um, you know, some colors, uh, discrimination, sensitivity to light, your acuity um, for uh, things is uh, down too. And so uh, good science uh, around that. And then the red eye um, that is caused from the um, vasodilation of the blood vessels. And this occurs with smoking and vaporization. It doesn't occur with the edibles. When you eat it, they don't get that reddening of the eye. Uh, so that's a thing too, is, you know, these edibles are so popular and, you know, they do deal with them in the schools. And, you know, the, you don't smell like the dope because you're not smoking it. 
Um, you don't have any baggies or anything. You've eaten the evidence, and you don't have that very distinct reddening of the eyes as well. So that is a thing. And then what they use the most with this is these rotodrops, which are a bleach, bleaching chemical uh, in these eye drops. And it say it can, um, you know, soothe the eyes and relieve that redness for multiple hours. You guys know Visine is a bleaching agent and bleaches your eyes for what? Maybe 10 minutes max, get real white. This uh, is hour uh, or so, maybe longer. And this is the number one thing they take off of kids in schools. Um, so uh, they'll tell that they're high, their eyes are real white, indicators. And so I can pass this around. You can get this stuff um, pretty much anywhere. But there is a bleaching agent in there that is concerning to the eye doctors. Uh, my eye doctor was telling me at the um, national conference last year, they had someone presenting on marijuana in the eyes and said they're very concerned about these bleaching agents, that the bleaching agents will damage the eyes permanently and they'll always have that reddening of the eye and nothing will be able to change that. So they're concerned with the bleaching agents and things people are using to bleach that uh, red out. So this is just, you can consider that paraphernalia that's out there that a lot of kids use. Here is paraphernalia. Uh, and it could be absolutely anything, and paraphernalia only tells us one thing, and that is we have a drug user. These are highlighters, fake highlighters. They're a pipe in the back. And so, you know, any way that you can disguise it obviously is a big thing. Um, obviously, these are marijuana pipes, as are these. Um, a lot of kids will smoke pot. Uh, and take an empty toilet paper roll, shove it with dryer sheets, and then smoke pot in their house. They do it in the bathrooms at schools. Uh, SRO and the security team tells me all the time they'll, they'll hit the pipe or uh, take a bong hit and blow it all into the dryer sheets. Um, so uh, a lot of heroin users do that as well. It gets rid of the odor. So if you see brown dryer sheets in your house, that's probably a clue, especially if they're in the trash with empty toilet paper rolls. They will make fruit. Uh, pipes as well. Uh-oh, has she been busted? No. Oh, good. Okay. We were, we were oh, okay. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Good to know. I'll have to tell parents that from now on. Um, so, yeah, they make fruit pipes. I don't know if you guys have seen it, and they smoke every type of drug imaginable in it. They'll take apples or pears and core it and shove aluminum foil down near the bottom, take a pen apart and shove it in there. They drill a hole right in the fruit. Drip the, dribble the dope onto the alumafoil, light it beneath, and as it goes up the core, they breathe it in. Um, and then it takes on the odor of the, uh, odor of the sugarness and the taste uh, of the fruit. So if you see a banana pipe or jerry-rigged fruit, that just is not normal. Um, and so that is paraphernalia. So um, all kinds of craziness goes on. Paraphernalia, again, anything. Uh, grinders, uh, rolling paper, you know, crack pipes, uh, vials, um, little containers. These are Hydecans and they are weighted and they feel and look just like whatever is on the label. And then you open the top or the bottom and it's all hollow inside. Um, they sell them online to hide your jewelry. I have been on thousands of drug deals and I have never seen jewelry in any of them. And so you can buy them in the pot shops, you can buy them in the smoke shops, everywhere. And they have everything imaginable. They have the energy drinks, they have beers, they have sodas, they have Pringles and you shake it. Sounds like a Pringles container and you pop the bottom and the whole inside's hollow. They have a women's hairbrush. They have everything, started fluid, baby wipe. I've seen green beans, um, uh, WD-40, uh, everything. The coolest one is the AA battery. It says Duracell AA. You pop the top and it spins and then you stack your pills on the inside of it. It's the cutest little thing you ever did see. Um, and so these are all hide cans. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's a, a nice way to hide things. This is from a high school. A kid jerry-rigged his inhaler. They will jerry-rig just about everything. And so paraphernalia means one thing, and that is that we have a drug user. And so, you know, the bottom line is when you're dealing with people, just pay attention to your senses. Take a good look at them. You know, what do you see? You know, are their eyes dilated or constricted? Are they red? Are they bloodshot? Are they grinding their teeth? You know, are they agitated? Do they have some tremors? You know, are they shaking? Um, do they have burns on their fingertips or lips? You know, crack pipes will do that as well. Some of the inhalants cause burning, especially the cold stuff that you spray, that air duster you spray on your computer. Um, you know, um, what do you smell? Obviously, alcohol uh, and marijuana and chemicals, if they're huffing paint, they smell of the chemicals that they consume. That means one thing. But vomit can be important because so many drugs make people sick. They could be withdrawing from the drug and vomiting a lot. So don't discount vomit 
um, that really could be another piece of it as well. Do they smell like excess perfume or aftershave? Kids will smear dryer sheets on their clothes to get rid of some of that uh, odor as well. And pay attention to what you hear. You know, are they speaking really, really fast and high pitched? Are they speaking very low and raspy? Um, are they talking fast? Are they taking a while to answer your questions? Um, you know, are you asking them a question about this, but they're off on a tangent over here and you can't follow the conversation? If you guys um, just use your senses, you can start to put everything together. Now, Urban Dictionary is a really, really good resource to have. You can get it on your desktop, your laptop, and you can get it on all your smartphones. And if you're hearing terminology that you don't understand, put it in Urban Dictionary. If it's a drug, it comes up in the top three tells you what the drug is, if it's laced with anything, and my fave, how to use it in a sentence, because we all got to know that stuff. And so it's awesome. Molly is not your, your child's friend. Molly is a designer drug. It's a mix of MDMA, ecstasy, and bath salts today, and it's dropping kids left and right. One of our newest drugs on the street is called gravel, and gravel is coke, meth, and bath salts. Um, and so if you're hearing terminology that you don't recognize, just put it in Urban Dictionary because it'll tell you if it's a drug, it'll tell you if it's for sexting or texting, it'll tell you what it all means. Um, so Urban Dictionary really is a good resource to have um, if you're hearing new weird terminology today. What is bath salts? Bath salts. Question is what are bath salts? Bath salts are a designer drug that is synthetically made in pharmaceutical companies. Most of these places are in China. Now, when I say pharmaceutical company, they're not like Pfizer or Glasgow Klein Wells, as we know pharmaceutical companies. These are drug labs. And so they are a designer drug that the chemical makeup is very similar to ecstasy, methamphetamine, and mescaline. And then uh, they alter the molecule. They keep changing it to fly under the radar of the law, uh, and you can't charge them for it. Uh, because DEA hasn't caught up yet, but they are psychedelic stimulants, meaning they fire up your system like coke and meth, but they make you hallucinate like LSD, mescaline, and ecstasy. They are 100, usually 98 to 100 percent pure, and they're full synthetic, and they're dropping kids left and right, but they're in the ecstasy family of drugs. You see a lot of similar things, body temperature getting really high because of the vasoconstriction, um, dehydrating, agitated, grinding the teeth, uh, they become paranoid and delusional because they're so potent that it just makes them crazy. Releases a lot of serotonin in their brain that makes them psychotic, see things and hear things. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we're seeing a lot and hearing a lot about bath salts and stuff today. So the other one would be the synthetic pot, K2 Black Mamba Spice, which is man-made synthetic THC. Uh, and it's coming out of the pharmaceutical companies as well. Other things are mixed in, but it's very, very potent, very potent. And they say it's like one to 300 times more potent than the THC in marijuana. And it is synthetic, so that causes a lot of problems too. Does that make sense? That's a good question. I get a lot about bath salts. So that's all I got to say about that. You guys have questions? Some of you look like you need to run screaming into the night. <laughs> Yeah, the question is, is are other drugs mixed in with marijuana? And certainly they are. PCP, you know, is always a problem. Uh, all other drugs could be put in. Um, you know, coke, meth, heroin, ecstasy, all other drugs could easily be put in. Now, you're not going to get the lay stuff from a marijuana dispensary, but certainly on the street forever they've had other drugs laced in marijuana. Why would somebody do that? Why would they do it? Yeah. Um, well, I think a lot of times they do it to get you up to the bigger, badder drugs because what do drug dealers care about? Do they care about you? No, they want the money out of your pocket. And certainly there's a lot of money in marijuana, but is it, it going to cost you a little more if you need some coke, meth, or God forbid heroin? Uh, and so I think they lace it in there and people don't know. So the only way you're going to know is if you've smoked pot before. So if you have uh, never smoked pot, and you buy some from this gentleman, and you think, oh, okay, that's kind of cool. Now you come and buy some from me because he's not around, or someone says, hey, go get it from Lynn, and I have something laced in it, and you try it, you're going to only think, whoa, this stuff is much better, or oh, my God, I hate it, and I'm going back to him. So does that make sense? So you only know if you've been exposed to the different drugs. Um, and so, uh, you know, if you only like mine and I've got Coke in it, pretty soon I say, hey, you know, I don't have any marijuana, but you want to try some Coke? Because it makes you feel about the same. And you're thinking, oh, I want to feel the same. And, and here we go. So I think that money 
has a lot to do with it and to get you moving up the ladder because drug dealers only care about one thing, and that is money. So does that kind of answer your question? I mean, forever we've had all drugs laced in all drugs. Certainly a lot of drugs get laced in heroin, cocaine being a big one. Um, you know, drugs can be laced with meth, um, all of them. Ecstasy gets a ton of drugs mixed in. So I think it just moves them up the ladder, gives them a little more bang for the buck, and then it costs more money. Yes? I can hook you up with Smart Colorado, who is five women that have given up their entire life. They have kids, uh, and they are down at the Capitol every day, all day, and have been for the last two plus years, making sure that this is regulated properly. And they have all kinds of insight that they can give you on what will work, what doesn't work. Uh, and I will connect you with them. I'll give you information as soon as I'm done here. I'm happy to do that. But, you know, just getting some consistency, um, I think, would be really, really good. Um, and, you know, being able to enforce it. And I know you guys have a great police department here. I have been in all the schools that these kids go to. I was in uh, Holy Family last week. I was in Broomfield um, last week. Um, and I'll be in Legacy next month. Um, and so, you know, I ask the kids all the time, is marijuana available? They say yes. And I always ask them, and I'll ask you guys, do you guys feel pressured to use marijuana? Are, t are kids today pressure, feeling pressure to use marijuana? No, it's just so available. Just so available, so you don't feel the pressure? Um, and a lot of kids say they feel very, very pressured. They have come down and testified at the Capitol saying they feel very pressured to use marijuana today uh, by other kids. So, you know, certainly I'll hook you up and we'll see what we can do. But uh, I know your SROs at the schools are awesome. Uh, you know, I know that uh, Matt has been trying to get uh, the city to ban the vaporizers and the e-cigarettes and stuff like that um, so that he has a little more bite when they are on school property, then he can get them. Uh, but right now, with nothing, they can't. And one thing you might want to look into is call some people up in Brighton because I understand that Brighton banned them uh, in the city of Brighton. And so you might contact somebody up with the city council. Yeah, ban the vapes and the e-cigarettes uh, and all that stuff. So you might contact up there. Uh, and ask them what they did and why. But I know when I've talked to Matt in Broomfield, he said if we could just get these vapes and the e-cigarettes and everything banned, he will have more, you know, a little more enforcement power on school property. Right, right now, there's nothing he can do about it. So talk to the police department too, but I'll hook you up with SMART. Thank you. Sure. You, you know, the question is when you have all these different edibles and especially baked good and brownies, sometimes you can get a little whiff of it and sometimes you can't. Um, so you can't always it, rely on, you know, getting a marijuana odor. It's not until you after actually ingest it and then, you know, 45 minutes to an hour in, start feeling some effects. Um, so, you know, the ones I bought, you know, certainly you could. Now if someone's making it at home, you know, I'd guess that you'd still get a little marijuana odor when you break it um, or eat it. But, you know, if, if people are smoking pot at a party and you're having an edible, do you necessarily think, oh, that odor might be coming from what I'm eating? Uh, and so that becomes a part of the problem, too, is if it's already in the air, you know, you just think, oh, someone's smoking pot, I'm just going to eat my cookie uh, and go from there. So does that make sense? So a lot of times you can, can smell it, especially when you break it and get it open. Other questions? No? Do you guys need to run screaming into the night? Are you all going to be okay? You guys can call me anytime. You can email me. I'm happy to help out. So thank you all for spending the evening here, and I hope you found it all valuable. So thank you very much.